Hi, everybody. We are here at uh, CrimCon towards the end of our first day on stream one. We'll give uh, just one or two minutes for attendees to, um, to, to trickle in here. It can take folks um, a minute or two to get connected to audio. While people are getting connected, I'm going to run you through the, uh, the ground rules here. Uh, panelists will have 10 minutes to, to present. We'll keep them uh, to time pretty strictly. Uh, as they're talking, if you have questions for the panelists, there's a button down at the bottom of your window that says Q&A. Click that and type in a, a question for the panelists. Uh, we're going we're gonna to be collecting those questions as we go through the panel. We'll answer them at, at the end after all of the, uh, after all of the presenters have um, had a chance to, to present. Uh, we are really excited today to have the ASC Division on Corrections and Sentencing Student Spotlight Exploring Disparities in Corrections and Sentencing panel. We are going to proceed in the order that's in the program. It's at crimcon.org slash program. And that will start us off with race and misconduct on death row, the subtle effects of prejudice. So we're going to go ahead and get started just in the, in the interest of time. Okay. Um, let's go. Everyone can see this? Yes, we can. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Teresa Trebolova, and I'm a PhD student at University of Nevada in Las Vegas. And today I'm going to be talking about a research project that I'm working on with my co-authors that basically deals with prejudicial treatment of death row prisoners. So there we go. So to kind of introduce the topic or the larger scheme of things, we know a lot about racial discrimination or racial disparities within the criminal justice system, right? There is a wide variety of research studies dealing specifically with racial disparities in capital sentencing, some of the classic studies like Baldas and studies in Georgia, finding that um, offenders with black victims are less likely to be sentenced to death same with Jennings, a little more recent study, finding through logistic regression models that uh, white victims or offenders with white victims are more likely to get sentenced to death. However, this, this kind of disappears when it comes to uh, when it comes to propensity score matching. But there is a lack of attention to racial discrimination or disparities post-death sentence, right? I'm actually pursuing my dissertation project right now, which looks at death row misconduct, not from a um, racial perspective, but more generally. And we really know very little about what happens on death rows, which I find fascinating. And it could be because, you know, the population is relatively small. So right now there's about 1500 individuals under enforceable sentence. So they're not being, um, they're being, re uh, they're not being resentenced currently. And um, also, you know, as we know, death penalty is kind of on its way out. So, you know, the academic attention is kind of, you know, trickling out. But because we also know that on average, uh, death row prisoners spend about 20 years on death row due to, you know, there is not a lot of executions occurring. It is really crucial to look at, um, proper um, administration of the sentence and also risk classification, right? Like internal risk classification. So it is an important inquiry. To talk about prior literature, there's really lack of consensus on whether minorities are more or less likely to commit misconduct. And not only is this problematic in regards to ethical and constitutional considerations, because race cannot be used as a predictive factor of or cannot be used for classification, right? But a lot of these studies also fail to take into account cultural context of these offenders, how, you know, whether seals are perceived as legitimate and how that affects offenders' behaviors. And also, we don't really know if there could be anything um, related to minorities being treated more prejudicially uh, while they're on death row. Which brings us to research on discretion because that, and that is mostly research in regards to police citizen interactions were raised to be a significant factor. And some a little more outdated and limited research as you can see, uh, Kool and Regoli is from 1980s. 
um, where it kind of suggests that minority prisoners may be overly supervised in, um, in institutions. So our theoretical rationale for, for this study is justification suppression model of prejudice, the JSM. Um, and it's basically postulating that individuals experience prejudicial feelings, but they avoid acting prejudicially or presenting prejudicial behaviors, especially in situations where it could get them in trouble. However, if there is a justifying race neutral factor, such as prior record, um, it must be present to kind of rationalize or justify prejudicial behaviors. So in this study, we're treating prior misconduct records, so prior to someone being sentenced to death as that justifying race neutral factor. So in our current study, we're looking at race and prior misconduct and how they're associated, if, whether they're associated with an increase in major and minor uh, infractions among death row prisoners. And we're looking at both race and prior misconduct as moderators, right? So we kind of switched it around because it's an, more of an exploration. Uh, what we're expecting based on our theoretical model is that minority death row prisoners who have a prior record of misconduct, so they have that justifying race neutral factor are at higher odds of being cited with misconduct on death row, both minor and ma major. How did we go about it? We have a sample of 118 current death row prisoners in Arizona um, to comment on descriptives of the variables of interest. A little over half of those sample is white, a little under half of the sample have committed pre-death row misconduct, and about three quarters of those prisoners currently on death row have misconduct during their death sentence. We collected all this data from offender search um, of Arizona Department of Corrections and who provide dates and all misconducts on their website. So we were able to distinguish which misconduct happened before death row and after death row because they collect data on all the prisoners justice involvement. We're also using their uh, classification minor and major. So minor misconduct would be usually nonviolent um, and major misconduct is either repeat misconduct or more serious misconduct or violent misconduct. We're analyzing our data using negative binomial regression because we have some, our dependent variables that are over dispersed count variables. So that's why we um, use this method. In regards to our results, when we look at prior misconduct as a moderator of race, we find that death row prisoners with no prior misconduct uh, Latinx prisoners are less likely to be cited for both minor and major infractions relative to white prisoners. But this completely switches when there is that justify or the, the way we uh, structure our rational when there is that justifying factor, that race neutral justifying factor of prior misconduct. When that occurs or when that is in place, Latinx prisoners are actually more likely to be cited for both minor and major infractions relative to white inmates. When we look at race as a moderator of prior misconduct, we see that prior misconduct is positively related to minor and major infractions among Latinx prisoners. So what does this all mean? Um, we find that there is no statistically significant differences in post-death penalty misconduct uh, among the groups, uh, the racial groups in our sample, but minorities are treated differently, right? In this study, we're looking at infractions as representations of CO's discretion, which I'll talk a little more about um, on the next slide. But I think in our future studies and in our future inquiries, we will want to only focus on minor or classify the misconduct ourselves as nonviolent because that's where discretion is most, I think, uh, most prominent. Uh, so that would definitely be something that we would like to do. And it's not very uncommon to look at minor or nonviolent misconduct as more like a, a, a produce of um, CO's discretion. What I find really interesting and also like plays into our theoretical rationale is that white prisoners without a prior misconduct record are treated more harshly than their counterparts, right? And this is uh, in thing of that trying to correct that prejudicial feelings, right? So we're gonna treat the majority a little more harshly. Um, 
to conclude, we think this is really worthwhile inquiry because like I said, death row is so understudied and, um, but you know, it's of course, um, it's of course our studies has, our study has some limitations. And I think the main limitation is the conceptualization of our dependent variables. Um, because, you know, it could be the behavior of the inmates, it could be the discretion of the CLs, and it could be a combination of both. But right now we have no way to kind of separate the two and see what really is happening. But it's the best measure uh, we could come up with. So, you know, that brings me to our next limitation, which is it's a cross-sectional design. So in the future, we would actually like to um, put together a more experimental design and vignettes where people like mock CEOs would read different scenarios and then make a decision to cite someone or not cite someone. In that way, we could uh, tease out those nuances a little bit more. Um, another limitation, of course, we only have one state represented, which is Arizona, and it can have some specifics that could you know, may not be applicable to other death rows or other prisons. So that is another limitation. And we have absolutely no information on the on the racial composition of the COs in prison, which could also um, impact our findings or what actually happens on death rows. In regards to some policy implication, uh, implications. I death row research is my passion, and it's always so hard to come up with policy implications because it's such a niche population. But uh, debiasing trainings and implicit bias trainings are worthwhile for any agency, I think, and they they tend to have some good results, at least in short term. You know, so that would definitely be something that could be applicable in this situation and you know on the whole agency level so it wouldn't necessarily just have to be applied to death row inmates and in regards to our future directions we would like to examine the causality through those experimental designs use a larger sample and look at racial diets of offenders and COs. and that is it from me thank you so much Great, thank you so much. Uh, you are right on time. Yes. Um, next, we have exploring the Scott Peterson case. Hi. <laughs> okay, let me share my screen here. Okay. And we've got it. Hi. Great. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Paige Bonavito, and I'm a student at Long Island University. And my thesis is called Exploring the Scott Peterson Case. So the original purpose of my thesis was to be a go-to source for research relating to the Scott Peterson case. I wanted to combine everything that I've learned about the case over the years into one source. So my thesis goes really, really in depth with the case, um, more than I can begin to cover here. So I definitely recommend checking out my full thesis for all the in-depth details. Um, I also wanted to figure out what the jury's reasoning was behind convicting Scott Peterson and giving him uh, the death penalty sentence, given that there's a lot of circumstantial evidence in his case as opposed to hard evidence that points towards his guilt. And I also wanted to figure out why he got the death penalty sentence he got compared to the Casey Anthony case, which is a similar case, but resulted in acquittal. Uh, so the Peterson case involves Scott Peterson's pregnant wife, Lacey. She went missing on Christmas Eve day in 2002 while she was walking her dog. Scott Peterson was fishing at the time of his wife's disappearance. And Lacey was very pregnant at the time of her disappearance. She was about eight months pregnant. So the community and the media were very anxious to find her. And while covering the case, those in the media and those who followed the case took notice of Scott Peterson's behavior. They noticed that he was somewhat helpful and concerned, but not as frantic as Lacey's family. So they felt that his behavior was suspicious, suspicious and that he may have had something to hide. And their suspicions were confirmed when this woman named Amber Fry came forward and said that she had been having a romantic relationship with Scott Peterson for about a month or so, not knowing that he was married. Um, and after Amber Fry came forward, those who followed the case started to believe that he was responsible for Lacey's disappearance. Uh, even Lacey's friends and family who had supported Scott up to this point withdrew their support of him. And Peterson, out of his own free will, then does a few TV interviews after Amber comes forward to try to clear his name. Um, but he comes off insincere in the interviews. And after his famous interview that he did with Diane Sawyer for Good Morning America airs, the public is pretty much convinced that he's guilty. Um, but even with all the incriminating evidence against Scott Peterson, police can't arrest him until they have more evidence about the whereabouts of Lacey and her unborn son. And then three and a half months after Lacey's initial disappearance, 
Uh, the decomposed remains of Lacey and her unborn son are found a day apart from each other on the shore of San Francisco Bay, which is where Scott Peterson was fishing the day of her disappearance. Um, so police arrested Scott Peterson after a car chase in San Diego. And due to the items that were found in Peterson's car, such as a large amount of cash and camping equipment, uh, those in the media speculated that Scott was attempting to flee to Mexico. Um, but I found in my research that this actually isn't really the case. Uh, he actually plans to go golfing with his family that day in the San Diego area and believed that the police that were following him were paparazzi since they were in unmarked cars. I go a little more in depth with this in my thesis, but I found that this is one of the elements of the case that the media dramatized that ultimately hurt Scott Peterson's reputation. And at the time of the trial, Peterson's lawyers actually requested that the case be moved from Modesto to Redwood City, which is about 40 minutes away. Both parties agreed that Scott Peterson couldn't get a fair trial in his hometown in Modesto where the case took place due to the overwhelming media coverage there. Uh, the prosecution's theory of the case was that Peterson strangled or suffocated his wife in their home sometime between the night before Christmas Eve and Christmas Eve morning. And this would explain the lack of forensic evidence that was found. Uh, they alleged that Peterson then transported his wife's concealed body to San Francisco Bay and dumped her overboard his fishing fishing boat using concrete anchors to weigh down her body. And they alleged that Peterson's motive for doing this was to be free of his responsibilities as a husband and father. And Mark Garagos, who represented Peterson, is a pretty well-known attorney. And he said that Scott Peterson was stone cold innocent. And he said that just because Peterson is a cheater doesn't necessarily mean that he's a murderer. And the case is what's known as a circumstantial evidence case. Uh, and circumstantial evidence is evidence in a trial which is not directly from an eyewitness or participant and requires some reasoning to prove a fact. Um, for example, Scott Peterson's affair with Amber Fry is a piece of circumstantial evidence. Having an affair doesn't mean you're guilty of murder, but it suggests that maybe you had something to do with it. Um, there was a lot of this kind of evidence in the Peterson case, but no solid proof of how Lacey was killed or even when specifically Lacey was killed. So that was definitely a challenge for the prosecution going into this case. Um, but nevertheless, the jury found Scott Peterson guilty of the first degree murder of his wife and the second degree murder of their unborn child. And they sentenced him to death by lethal injection. Uh, the jurors cited not only the affair with Amber Fry, but various other pieces of circumstantial evidence as crucial to their conviction. And they varied on which pieces of evidence were most important to them, but agreed that Mark Garagos, who represented Peterson, did an insufficient job at raising reasonable doubt. He came into the trial with this bold claim that he was going to prove his client innocent, which you don't even have to prove your client innocent as a defense attorney, um, but he said he was going to prove his client innocent, uh, but then he never really presented any evidence of that to back that up. And I wanted to compare this case to the Casey Anthony case because I noticed how these cases are very similar elements yet turned out differently. Um, the Peterson and Anthony cases both received nationwide media attention. They were both the most hated person in America at one point. Uh, they both involved the murder of a young child. Uh, Casey's daughter, Kaylee, was a young toddler when she was killed. Um, in both cases, the defendant exhibits behavior that shows that they're not concerned about their missing loved one. Casey Anthony was famously shown partying while her daughter was missing. Uh, the defendants both lied, Scott mostly about his affair, and Casey Anthony creating this fictitious nanny uh, who's watching Kaylee and saying that she worked at Universal Studios, which wasn't true. And the cases were both mostly circumstantial evidence and it couldn't be determined how the victim exactly died. Um, however, I came to the conclusion that Casey Anthony's lawyer, Jose Baez, was more successful at raising reasonable doubt for the jury. He provided several alternate theories of what could have happened, <coughs> saying that, um, Casey, that, that Kaylee may have drowned in the family pool on accident and that Casey Anthony's father molested Casey while she was a child and that's how she learned to lie and keep secrets. Um, and the media made fun of Baez for all these theories that he threw out during the trial but they ultimately did a much better job at raising reasonable doubt than what Mark Garagos did. Um, so while gathering my research, I obviously had to take into account the credibility of all my sources since everyone has something to say about this case. Um, and I thought it would be a good idea to reach out to Scott Peterson himself and get his perspective on his own case and ask him about information that isn't typically covered and what, you know, anything, any information he would have to offer. And I received this letter back and he responds to a question I asked about a woman named Donna Thomas who wrote a book claiming that he confessed to her. He denies the credibility of this book, which another one of my sources did as well. Um, he also noted that his habeas corpus appeal is a good place to get accurate facts about the case. And he also says that any look at the case would do well to include a look at the obsession with emotional and pejorative ideas over real scientific fact. And he also alludes to an account he's given in the past that he kept his affair hidden to preserve the search for Lacey. 
Uh, he alludes to the case of Gary Condit and Chandra Levy, where the search for Chandra Levy essentially stopped when it came out that Levy and Condit were romantically involved. Um, he also says that the Modesto police said of him, we convict people like Gary Condit, um, suggesting that they framed him. I couldn't find any actual evidence that they said this in my research, um, but nevertheless, this letter was definitely really helpful for getting a different perspective on the case. Um, so Scott Peterson has been on death row in San Quentin prison since 2005. Uh, and California hasn't executed anyone in a long time. And Governor Gavin Newsom actually opposed a moratorium on the death penalty in 2019. Um, so the death penalty executions are banned for the time that Newsom is in office. And Peterson's case is currently on appeal right now and actually has been in the news recently since the California Supreme Court overturned his death sentence. Uh, the court also ordered the lower San Mateo court where he was originally tried to look into overturning his conviction. So he'll at the very least be getting a new penalty phase of his trial but he might possibly get a new trial overall. Um, I've included a, a recent Zoom meeting screenshot regarding his appeal. And the issue mainly in his appeals is over this woman, juror Rochelle Nice. Uh, when she filled out her juror questionnaire, she said that she had never been involved in a lawsuit. Um, meanwhile, she had been involved in a lawsuit and it was actually a restraining order she filed against someone while she was pregnant. And in the paperwork for the restraining order, uh, she said that she feared for the life of her unborn child. Um, so uh, the, lawyer, the defense, Scott's defense team uh, believes that maybe she was a stealth juror and that she may have been biased against Peterson and more sympathetic to the prosecution for the sake of the unborn child involved. So definitely something to look at. Uh, in conclusion, the case is so fascinating because it makes you think about how much media coverage could impact a trial. Um, it's debatable whether Peterson could have gotten a fair trial at all, considering he was already convicted in the court of public opinion before his trial. Um, it also shows the power of circumstantial evidence with the right attorneys. Peterson was represented by Mark Garagos, who is a well-known lawyer, um, but he really didn't make the case and present alternate theories for Scott's innocence as well as someone like Jose Baez could have. And this is a very interesting case to study. There's a lot of layers to it and it's, it's still in, de in development today. And even though I've researched this case for quite a few years now, I'm still learning new things about it. And so many people believe Scott Peterson is guilty based on only what they've seen or heard in the media, but it's important to look beyond the media and, you know, get the facts for yourself. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, another presentation right on time. We're, All right. Great. We're great. <laughs> I was worried about that. You guys, are, you guys are fantastic. Of, a lot of information in this case. <laughs> it is. Okay. So we will move um, next to sentencing intimate partner homicides, uh, the example of the Portuguese Supreme Court of Justice. Hello, I hope you can see me and hopefully you will be seeing the PowerPoint soon. That's it, I think. Uh, thank you. Yep, we got it. Perfect, thank you. So uh, it's really an honor to be here. Thank you very much for having this conference. It is really a huge opportunity for us uh, students to present something in this atypical year. Uh, so thanks for the, the opportunity. Mm -hmm. My name is Cathy Pontedeira. I'm from Portugal in Europe. Um, so apologize if uh, my English is not the, the best American English, neither the best English uh, at all, uh, but I will try to express myself the, the best as possible. So my PhD is uh, about intimate partner homicides. I'm being supervised by a professor from Portugal and another professor from England. Um, my study is um, about uh, intimate partner homicides specifically uh, and in Portugal. In Portugal, we don't have sentencing guidelines, just to make you a background on, on the, the Portuguese legal uh, framework. We do have a panel code where all, all uh, criminal uh, offenses are categorized and have a specific sentence range. Uh, but we don't have any type of sentencing guidelines within this uh, specific framework. So for the case of homicide in general, uh, there are three main types of homicides that are uh, displayed in, in this slide, especially homicide, qualified homicide, and privileged homicide. Um, for the homicide, I've placed here in the slide so that you can have a better perception, an, a, an offender would get from 8 to 16, 16 years of imprisonment time. Uh, so this would be the sentence range for this crime. 
then qualified homicide would be those homicides that are considered most more the most serious. So imagine someone who kills, for example, a cop or uh, a doctor in, in, in a, a patient doctor relationship uh, that would be a qualified homicide. And the sentence would be from 12 years uh, imprisonment term up to 25 years imprisonment term. And I should say that in Portugal, uh, we don't have life imprisonment. So 25 years is actually the maximum that anyone could get, no matter, no matter how many crimes uh, a person would commit. So 25 years is really the, the top maximum that you would get in Portugal if you committed an offense. And another category of uh, homicide, it's privileged homicide. This is considered perhaps the least serious form or type of homicide. And uh, for privileged homicide, we would consider those homicides committed uh, with a great level of passion or a, a, a very strong emotion that takes the, almost takes the responsibility from the perpetrator. So with this sentence framework, you can see that uh, for a crime that is uh, um, attacking another's life, you, you might have different types of sentences. So my interesting was looking at how is intimate partner homicide being uh, sentenced in Portugal? And in fact, I have been concluding that we do have cases that are judged, judged as homicide, as qualified homicide, and also as privileged homicide. It really de depends on, up to the case. And as you can see, if we ha have all these three options, uh, it might get a bit of, uh, of uh, uh, confusing and, and, and it does have space for subjectivity and uh, some discrepancies as well. So that, that was my main interest to, to look um, on, on these specific sentences. Mm -hmm. Also, I should say that it is up to a judge or, uh, 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 or three judges in, in, in agreement on the specific sentence. We don't have the figure of the jury in Portugal. So uh, it is a, the judge who decides uh, how many years this person will actually get in prison between 8 and 16 or between 12 and 25. So it's up to a judge decision. So the methodology of my study, before I explain that further, I just want to highlight what is the Supreme Court of Justice in Portugal. Uh, we do have first instance court and all criminal offenses go to court for the first instance. Uh, so all category of crimes, all types of crimes, the less serious and the more serious, they all come into court in the first instance. But then uh, after the first sentence is passed, um, the public pr prosecutor, the assistants who are usually the victims or family members and the defendant might apply for an appeal. And then you go to the second instance and still they might ap apply to an appeal again and then finally it reached the Supreme Court of Justice, which is in the case of the criminal law uh, in Portugal, the most uh, uh, superior in terms of uh, hierarchical position. So there's nothing above the Supreme Court uh, apart from the constitutional court and usually cases don't go that much up, up, up high. So uh, um, just to say that it can be the perpetrator who keeps appealing up to the Supreme Court and is not actually that difficult. A lot of homicide cases reach the Supreme Court because homicide cases uh, have heavier sentences and therefore the defendant is always trying to um, put sentences a bit lower. So they always try to appeal over and over and over again. So my interest was to analyze cases from the Supreme Court of Justice since 1983 up to 2017. 83 because it was when our penal code was completely reformulated, so it suffered a great deal of changes, and 2017 because it was the year that I started the, the, the research. I'm looking at homicides and attempted homicides, and I tried to gather all cases that reached the Supreme Court uh, between these years. So I'm analyzing them qualitative and quantitatively. Uh, and at this moment, I have about 100 sentences. I am aware that, that I don't have them all yet, but due to coronavirus, I couldn't really get to the Supreme Court and get the rest of the files. That is why the, the main uh, conclusions that I have here for today 
uh, basically descriptive and not that much the inferential statistics that I haven't done yet because I don't have the whole uh, sample uh, yet all finalized. But I'm assuming that I have uh, almost all from 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 the, at least the, the most recent periods, as you will see. Uh, and I will talk a little bit about this second uh, study further uh, on the presentation. But as you will see, my cases here, I have I present um, uh, the, 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 the framework of time in which my the cases are, are reflecting to. And as you can see, from 91, uh, I start to have some cases, but very few, very just one per year until 2002. And it's obviously that I'm lacking data here. And this is because this type of data in Portugal is online at this moment. So all cases from the Supreme Court are supposed to be online. But obviously, uh, the more recent we are, more online cases uh, uh, we have record. And I'm lacking all those other that are older. And those were the ones that I was aiming to, to get from the Supreme Court in terms of physically the Supreme Court place. So I have uh, here some statistics from, from these 100 sentences and keeping in mind that we are talking about intimate partner homicides committed in Portugal, uh, they are obviously uh, a result of uh, usually um, a very long period of domestic violence, for example, with high patterns of uh, coercive control and, and uh, unequal, unequal uh, gender uh, power relationships. So not surprisingly, 91% of the offenders are male and 9% of the offenders are female. And I should say that in these cases, almost all are uh, uh, female uh, perpetrators of homicide who have been actually victims of domestic violence for long periods of time. I cannot say that these are all the cases of female perpetrators, obviously. We do have also some female perpetrators that just killed their husbands without a, a previous domestic violence background but I should say that it's a majority. 26% of the overall cases have criminal background. In three cases, only three, uh, we did have some previous conviction for murder or attempted murder. And only in two cases, there were a previous con uh, conviction on domestic violence before this intimate partner homicide. Not always against the same person that the, the perpetrator tried to kill or actually killed uh, in this study. So from the centers that I've had so far, and bear in mind that it's not the full picture yet, uh, from 100 sentences, 55 actually changed. So you can see that it is the more than half of the sample do change. That's why defendants keep appealing um, to the Supreme Court as well. In 39 cases, the sentence actually decreased. So the, the, the perpetrators were successful in terms of the appeal they, they have done. Uh, in 11 cases, the sentence actually increased for the offender, and these were cases where actually it was the public prosecutor or the assistant's family members of the victim uh, that might have appealed to the Supreme Court. And then we have another two that kept the arguments and just, uh, sorry, that changed the, the, the arguments but kept the sentence per, in terms of number of years. Uh, and we have three cases that were sent back for a completely new trial. I'm analyzing qualitatively and quantitatively these specifically for the dissertation. Um, and just to, for you to have an idea in terms of sentences, we can see that most uh, of the sentences um, get uh, uh, here in this period of time of uh, 192 months, about 16 years of imprisonment time. And just to finish my presentation, uh, I would like to, to pose a, a challenge for you. Um, I will do uh, from this sentencing study where I'm actually looking at the sentences afterwards, I will do a factorial survey with general population and professional uh, legal professional backgrounds, oh, sorry, legal background professionals, that's the way. Um, and I will be looking at intimate partner homicides and see how specific factors would change their perception on the severity of the homicide and sentence. So if anyone around in this conference is uh, has actually have done a factorial survey, please send me your email because I'm sure we can uh, share a lot and you can help me a lot in this next stage of the, the dissertation where I'll be looking into these um, factors and compare those with the actual sentences. 
So thank you very much for your attention. I hope I kept somehow my time. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, next, we have judicial variation in sentencing and the contribution of caseloads and contexts. Just a reminder for, for folks, if you've got questions for our, our panelists, um, hit that Q&A button down at the bottom of the window and type your question in. Um, we'll get to as many questions as we can at the end here. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Claire Strange, and I'm a doctoral candidate at the University of Cincinnati. Um, and today I'm presenting on a, a very abridged uh, subset of results from uh, my dissertation entitled Judicial Variation in Sentencing and the Contributions of Caseloads and Contexts. So um, to this point, research shows that outcomes between similar defendants across the legal process, uh, they vary. And so uh, reviews of the research generally emphasize that we need to move beyond identifying disparities in outcomes to um, sort of understanding better the mechanisms that lead to them. And so judicial discretion is definitely one uh, potential mechanism that has been explored. So my dissertation, or at least a piece of it specifically, um, focuses on um, answering how much uh, between judge variation in punitiveness exists, uh, specifically within the Florida guidelines system, and to what degree is this variation judge imposed? And so in order to answer this question, I use, uh, I sort of base my analyses on two fairly popular um, theories of court actor discretion. The first being focal concerns theory, which in a nutshell um, asserts that court actors uh, perceive defendants differently in terms of their dangerousness and their blameworthiness, as well as the practical um, constraints and consequences of the punishment. Um, and that their perceptions of these factors dictate the severity of the punishment or the decision that is made. And so there's a lot of um, focal concerns based research that suggests that some of these attributions such as dangerousness and blameworthiness um, are actually tied to defendants extra legal factors. Um, and then second, uh, I also lean on threat perspectives as a theoretical backdrop. And so again, in a nutshell, threat perspective suggests that as uh, perceived threat increases in an area, um, so do formal social controls such as sentencing. And so this has been conceptualized often as racial or ethnic threat. So growing uh, minority populations in an area or underclass threat, um, you know, greater inequality in an area. These have been associated with um, tighter formal social controls. And so to uh, answer these questions, I use data from the Florida Sentencing Guidelines database, which is um, nearly 2 million felony cases. It's every felony case processed in Florida between 1994 and 2011. Um, but I aggregate these cases to roughly 2,000 judges that appear in the data set. And um, I added to the data set judge, various judge characteristics as well as contextual characteristics at the county level. And so um, I, I um, conceptualize punitiveness in three different ways, um, those being proportion caseload upward departed, proportion caseload sentenced to prison, and then last, the proportion caseload sentenced 12 or more months beyond the permissible minimum sentence. Um, and these sort of you know, represent the traditional outcomes of punitiveness when we look at upper departures, prison, and sentence length. And so the analyses proceed in multiple steps. Uh, I begin with bivariate analyses, just looking at differences in punitiveness across these three outcomes, um, looking across judge characteristics. Um, and then I move on to multivariate analyses, looking at uh, mixed effects, multi-level multi -level linear models um, with judges and caseloads nested within counties and uh, no contextual predictors at level two. And then the last set um, of the, or the last stage of the analysis is having these same models, but adding contextual predictors and cross-level interactions. And so I'm not gonna go through these in detail, um, but these are the judge predictors of interest. Um, and these are all things that have in one, you know, some piece of research or another been associated with um, increased punitiveness. Um, and I'll talk about a couple of these more specifically as they apply uh, to the outcomes or to the results. These are the caseload predictors. Again, um, I aggregate um, 
the defendant level characteristics to the judge level just to maintain the judge as the center of focus. And so these are all the measures that you would typically see um, you know, in a traditional um, sentencing study that has defendants, uh, defendant characteristics. So we're looking at case severity, um, the crime type, as well as uh, beyond the legal factors, we're also looking at extra legal factors such as uh, the proportion male, black, Latinx caseload, average defendant age, and things of that nature. And then these are the county predictors that I include. Again, I won't go through all of these, um, but they're meant to represent some of those theoretical concepts of threat as well as um, focal concerns and particularly the practical constraints uh, that contribute to sentencing decisions. So um, here are the, the descriptive statistics of the sample. Um, in a nutshell, the sample is largely white and male. Um, I have just placed an asterisk, an asterisk here next to the characteristics where there were significant differences in punitiveness um, across the characteristics. So male judges were significantly more punitive than female judges. White judges were more punitive than black or Latinx judges. Um, former military were more punitive than those who do not have a military history. And those that had some sort of religious affiliation were um, more punitive as well than those who did not. So, um, so there's already right off the bat, there's some interesting variation that exists across judges in punitiveness. Um, and so the next step is to sort of add these caseload factors that according to theory should at least um, explain some of the variation away. So, um, this is an abridged version of the table. <laughs> so this first set of analyses, again, this is a two level model and we're looking at judge and caseload characteristics within counties. Um, and these three models do not have contextual uh, predictors added. There's just counties at level two. So um, notably, none of the judge predictors uh, were significant. So they did not predict um, any of the three uh, punitiveness um, outcomes. Um, second, all legal and extra legal caseload predictors were significant in at least one of the three models, though the ones that I have pictured here were significant across all three. So I, I saw these as sort of the more consistent uh, predictors. Um, and then generally, I would say, though, that the legally relevant predictors, caseload predictors, were um, more consistent. They explained more of that variation than did the extra legal predictors, even though um, each, each case load measure was significant in one of the three models. Um, and so this is the last stage of the analysis. So this is the same set of models with um, contextual predictors added to level two. And here you can see, um, I've, only, I've only displayed some selected significant effects here. So, um, but you can see when you add uh, county characteristics at level two, that judge race and ethnicity become uh, significant predictors although none of the other uh, characteristics were. So here you can see that uh, black judges were significantly more punitive in model three, which is the one that looked at sentence length. And Latinx judges were more uh, punitive uh, in relation to white judges, which is the reference group in upward departures and prison, uh, the proportion sentence to prison. So uh, like table 1.2 that I just showed, all the caseload measures, legal and extra legal, were significant. Uh, again, in, in this table here, I just haven't pictured them for space. Uh, but just so you know, there's that consistency across these models, regardless of whether we add um, county level predictors. Um, and then the last four rows here are uh, the county level predictors that were significant. So. Um, these had direct, albeit small, uh, impacts on at least one of the three outcomes, as you can see here. And so in, in conclusion, um, judges, they vary in their punitiveness beyond what is explained by the seriousness of their caseloads. So um, this is somewhat consistent with the theories that I presented at the beginning of the slideshow. So, um, you know, judge effects, at least to this point in the analysis, they appear to be minimal with black and Latinx judges um, being more punitive than white judges in the last set of models that includes contextual predictors. Um, legal and extra legal, legal caseload characteristics were predictive of punitiveness across all the models, 
although the legally relevant characteristics, as we would expect, were the most consistent. Um, and then again, some of the county level contextual factors also had direct impacts. Um, and that sort of leads me into the next steps, which is to examine cross-level interactions, which I think are going to be probably the most interesting piece of um, this chapter. And uh, I'm just going to put them up here. So these are meant to look at sort of judge and county um, characteristics of race, of um, of political affiliation, of crime. So this will sort of provide some really unique insight, I think, it, specifically for um, threat perspectives and looking at how different judges uh, seem to be impacted by the characteristics of their counties. Um, and uh, so my next steps, uh, once I complete this set of analyses, I'm gonna then sort of turn my focus to judge consistency and use a very similar analytic approach, but looking at how judges vary in the sentences that they give within themselves. Um, and so there are some limitations to this, of course. Um, Mona Lynch uh, published last year, um, sort of a critique of the way that focal concerns has been tested. Um, you know, throughout the years. And so I, I do have to say that this is not a direct test of focal concerns theory, but it does certainly sort of fall in line with the body of research um, that supports that theory. Um, and again, I'm looking at uh, sentencing decisions specifically. So um, I'm not capturing earlier decisions or the contributions of other legal actors to these decisions. Um, and I'll stop there, thank you. Great, thank you so much. Uh, all of our presenters in this panel were uh, very mindful of their time. Um, they're far better than I am. We have time for, for just a couple of questions. Um, so for Teresa, did the relationship between prior misconduct and Latinx and white populations exist for black white prior misconduct populations? Um, yeah, we actually saw the same pattern but it wasn't statistically significant, which we found really interesting. But that's, again, what I think could be a very specific uh, case of Arizona. Um, thank you. And um, a question about um, a Portuguese processing. Is there a pretrial uh, time frame? Right, uh, yes, there is. Um... Uh, actually, when, when a case uh, gets to the police, we do have a whole investigation stage done by both the police, and then the case goes to the prosecution service, who is responsible for protecting the system and protecting the victim, uh, and it is the prosecuting service who uh, suggests a time frame, uh, a specific sentence for that perpetrator and for that crime. Only after that, the, the crime goes to, to the court, but I should remember that it goes to the first instance court, which is not the court that I'm analyzing. Uh, so I wouldn't know. Uh, I wouldn't know from these cases that I'm analyzing the influence of this uh, pre-trial suggestion. Uh, but I am aware that some studies have been done on 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 the impact of the suggestion from of the prosecution service for for the first instance courts, and there is actually an influence uh, in terms of judge usually. Uh, uh, tend to, to correlate to what prosecution service usually suggests. Um, but from my uh, study, as I'm analyzing Supreme Court, I could only compare with the second instance court. And that is why where, where I say uh, if uh, the sentence change or not. And I don't know if I can um, answer also to the other question already. Yeah, the rate of recidivism. And uh, uh, um, I think I, I have another one as well about the what do I actually mean when when I say the uh, sentence is changed. Um, it um, re really what can be changed actually is both. So the number of years within a specific crime, and it can actually change the crime itself from homicide to qualified homicide, or the reverse from qualified homicide to homicide. So there is a, a whole amount of possibilities and that's why I'm analyzing the cases qualitatively as well to understand on which grounds do these uh, change actually happen? What, what are being the arguments that are being uh, uh, actually successful? 
uh, the recidivism in terms of uh, homicides is, is usually very low, very low. So, so I, I don't know the actual statistic, but to, to let you know, but it is low, yeah. Well, that is thank all the time you. that we have. Yeah, thank you so much for the for the questions uh, from from the audience and to our panelists. Thank you for participating in our conference. This is the last presentation of the day um, in this stream. There is a, an impromptu meeting at 9 p.m. U.S. Eastern Standard Time on Stream Two. Um, that's a little bit of a um, of a victory lap from CrimCon's president. We've been um, pretty successful today with a few tech hiccups here and there, but nothing nothing tragic. Um, we will be back in um, in CrimCon tomorrow, and then again on Thursday. So check our website crimcon.org/program uh, for webinar links and for the for the program um, there. If you're looking for video from this session, that video will be posted to YouTube soon. Um, we're going to have that up in the next couple of weeks. You can uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel, um, search YouTube for CrimCon, you'll find us. Um, or you can join our mailing list, uh, crimcon.org. Um, towards the bottom, you can subscribe to our mailing list. And we'll, we'll let everybody know once we have these sessions up. Thank you again to our panelists and to our attendees. It's been very interesting. Uh, it's great work. Keep it up. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.